Well, good morning. Welcome to church this morning. I'm glad you guys woke up, and I hope you guys are excited to, to get into the Word. We're going to be in James. So if you have your Bibles, James chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 13, and we'll go all the way to chapter 5, verse 6. Hopefully you got um, a, a program that's what we call the Baywatch. It's all in there as well, or it's on our SBCC app. Well, as you guys are getting ready and, and getting there, uh, you know, one thing I love about the Christian church in general, and I think it's well reflected here in this particular church, is the fact that people can come from, from different backgrounds, different upbringings, different uh, cultures and environments, and yet we can find ourselves in the same place. We find common ground. I love that here in this church, like, you can find a judge, and you can find one who years ago was convicted of attempted manslaughter. I, I love that here in this church, you can, you, you can find one who has spent most of his life dealing illegal street drugs, and you can find one who has spent most of her life dealing pharmaceutical drugs, and yet we find ourselves under the same roof. I love here that, that some of you guys have met the, this Caucasian guy who had Japanese parents growing up, and then you can meet a guy, a Japanese guy who used to sell burritos in his lifetime, all under one roof. And we come together being so different, yet we find common ground in one name. His name is Jesus. Amen? That we find common ground in Christ, and that's what draws us together. And I, I love that diversity here in the body of Christ. And yet with such diversity and different upbringings and backgrounds and cultures, inevitably we're going to find ourselves in the same place, yet we may have different perspectives different takes on issues, and even different views of morality. And we call those things gray issues when, when they're kind of controversial. For example, I remember years ago at my previous church, this is around like 2005, a group of us, there's six of us from my church, and we were mostly leaders in the church. We went to Hawaii for a friend's wedding, and we were hanging out. And I remember one night, one of the guys in our group brings back a six-pack of beer to the room for us just to fellowship over and I remember just being so troubled by that at the time. Like, it truly troubled my soul, and, and, and I had to think about it, and eventually I wrote this long email rebuking each of those guys for drinking that beer. Now, I have a fellow Christian friend who's a young pastor, church planner, just planted his church, and I'm getting these blasts of, uh, uh, of these upcoming meetings for this new church, and one of the flyers for their first events was, come to this men's gathering over cigars and whiskey. And you call yourself a pastor, right? You shame on you. Some Christians think it's wrong to have a beer. Some Christians love to fellowship over cigars and whiskey. Who's right and who's wrong? I, I, I remember growing up, I would never cuss because Christians don't cuss. You don't do that. Recently, I was at the gym, and I was talking to this guy, and we always chat here and there. And then when he found out I was a pastor, he got excited because he says, I'm a Christian too. I've been saved by the gospel. And he, he just goes off on how much he needs Jesus and how, how, how much Jesus has changed him. And it, he goes off into like this mini sermon. And as he's talking, I'm like, amen, amen. Everything in my heart is agreeing with this guy. Amen, amen. He's like, yeah. And Jesus can even save a piece of beep like me. I'm like, oh, what? He's like, yeah, we're all pieces of beep. And then he goes, beep, beep. And like, I'm like, oh, my virgin ears. Like, what's going on right now? <laughs> right? Some Christians think it's totally wrong because some have no problem with it. Who's right? Who's wrong? We call these great issues. And and yet, I think a lot of times, the things we consider great issues really aren't great at all. That if you would take a closer look at Scripture on some of these issues and really look at what the heart of God is saying to us through the Word, we'll find that it's really not gray, but the Scripture paints it as either pure black, pitch black, or pure white. If we would just take the time to study it. And in studying today's passage, there's two important issues that... James addresses, and I believe these issues are going to come up for a lot of us, if not all of us in the church, if we are serious about our faith. And if you consider James's language, there's nothing great about it. There's nothing great about it. That's the title of today's message. We're going to look at two issues, and here's the questions I want to ask today. The first is this, is it wrong for Christians to plan out their future? 
Is it wrong for Christians to plan out their future? You already have an answer in your heart for that. The second question is, is it wrong for Christians to be rich? And maybe you have an answer for that already. You might be surprised by what the word has to say. You might be convicted by the answers you'll find if we would just dive in. Okay, so that, let's do that right now. We're going to dive into the word. Before we do that, let's pray and ask the Spirit of God to lead us there. Oh, Father God, we just want to ask right now, Lord, that you would be our teacher, God. Especially when it comes to issues that may be controversial, Lord, we need to go to the source. You are the source. And God, I pray that uh, my opinions wouldn't come out this morning, but that your truth would come out. So, Lord, we give you our hearts and our ears, and, Lord, we pray that as a church we would think critically about your word and what it says, and we would live faithfully in response, that we would put our faith into action. So, God, would you take over this time, God? Here's our hearts. Here's our minds. Speak into it for your name's sake. Bless your church and change us. And we pray this according to the powerful name of Jesus. We all say amen. 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 Here's the first question we're going to ask this morning. Is it wrong for Christians to plan out their future? Is it wrong for Christians to plan out their future? I'd love for you to follow along in the notes. By show of hands, you could be honest, how many of us love to plan for our lives? Yeah, like we, will, we like to know what the road ahead looks like. Amen? Amen? Amen. A lot of us. Well, here's what James has to say to you guys. Verse 13, he says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What's your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is, circle this word, evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. You could pause right there. And so who's James talking to? He's talking to those of us who like to have our lives mapped out. We like to have our plans in place. We like to have our ducks all set up in a row. I I get that. We we all plan. I I plan. I I knew. By the time I was in college, I knew what my life was going to look like. I knew what it was going to, I knew that after college I was going to work in a marketing firm because I've always wanted to do advertising and marketing. That was my heart. I knew that by 23, that's when I was going to start dating. 23, I was going to date and, and I'd meet that girl. We would date for only about two years. That's all it really takes to get to know someone. We'd be married by 25. And then when we got married at 25, obviously we wouldn't have kids right away because we would, we would want to enjoy the freedom. It would just be in Bay, and we would go and travel and do, do vacations and explore the world and have fun. And then two years after getting married, then we'd settle down and be responsible. And then we'd have a kid at 27. That was my plan. And, and I know that that's, that's a big deal, right? That, that's a financial responsibility, but that's okay because by 27, I'd be well established in my industry. I'd be making a lot of money, so I could handle a kid in fact, not just one, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be able to provide for two kids, which I would have by 29. And so I had plans. And for those of you guys who know me and you know, you know my life, you look at my life and what? Crushed it. Crushed it. Not me. God crushed it. He crushed my dreams and my plans and replaced it with his own. Because I, I didn't get married until 29. I was supposed to have two kids by then. Right? I started dating. We didn't date for two years. We, we dated for five years against our will. Our parents said, you guys have to finish your graduate studies. And so not two years, five years. Once we got married, we said we'd wait two years to have kids. We didn't wait two years. We waited five months, <laughs> right? Like five months. Like we, we, we started playing. And then God goes, no, you, you ain't having fun. We started in this party now. Right? You're, you're having kids, right? And we found out we were pregnant. We're, we were caught off guard. Like, we weren't ready for this. And then he goes, by the way, you're not going to be a marketer. You're going to be a pastor. Ha ha. Right? Right? You ain't making Benjamins. You're making disciples. Okay? And so, so my life, totally, the, the script got flipped. And he says, this is what your life is going to look like. And, and for those of us who, who say, I, I know what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do. I know where I'm going to go. I know what it's going to look like. James says, please, please, don't think that you hold your whole whole universe in your own hands because you don't 
Each new day is a day that belongs in the hands of a sovereign God. Some of us, we have the attitude of, I know what I want and I'm going to get it. If I would just work hard enough and, and, and put my head down and grind, I'm going to get it. And that may be because you're an A-type personality, you're a go-getter, or it may not be. Maybe you're just a normal human being who loves to dream, and it's natural for us to pursue our dreams. In reality, we don't know what tomorrow holds. The God who holds our lives, he's already seen what your tomorrow looks like, right? He, he knows what tomorrow looks like. Why? Because... He's already seen it. In fact, he, he knows what 10 years from now looks like for you. Why? Because he's authored that year. What, how, how about 50 years from now? 50 years, 50 years from this day. He knows what 50 years from this day looks like. Why? Because he holds it in his hand. He owns that day. How, how many of you guys are familiar with the name Frank Pastore? Anybody know who Frank Pastore is, KKLA? Yeah, man. Well, he was a major league baseball player first, pitched for the Cincinnati Reds and later for the Twins. But then he was an atheist who became a Christian. And he hosted the Frank Pastore show on KKLA, and it became the largest Christian talk show radio, uh, radio show in the nation. And so imagine me, I, I was starstruck when we got to have him speak at our college fellowship when I was in college. He actually came out to guest speak, and, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's Frank Pastore. And, and after our meetings, we would get in the circle, and we would join hands and pray to close out the, the, the meeting. Guess who got to hold Frank Pastore's hand? Guess who? Yeah, this guy right here got to hold his hand, and I was like starstruck. I'm holding Frank, his hands were massive, and, I, and I'm holding, and... And after, after the prayer, he turns and he looks at me, and guess what he says? No joke. He looks me in the eye and he goes, man, your hands are sweaty. <laughs> like, he's like, I was like, oh, oh, right? I haven't washed my hands since. And so, 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 so here we are, and, I, and this guy's just like doing these great things, talking about Jesus, intersecting faith and reason, bringing his philosophy background, and helping people understand the truth of God. And and if you've ever listened to a show, you know that he loves motorcycles. He talks about it all the time. And I think one of the most memorable shows um, was when he started to talk about life after death. And he, he started talking about how these bodies of ours, this is just a tent. And yet our soul is eternal. He's talking about the eternality of the soul. Life goes on after death. I want to play for you an audio clip from that show. Listen to what he has to say. I mean, look, you guys know I ride a motorcycle, right? So at any moment, uh, especially with the idiot people who cross the diamond lane into my lane, all right, without any blinkers, not that I'm angry about it, but uh, at any minute, I could be spread all over the 210. But that's not me. That's my body parts. He says, I love motorcycles. At any moment, my life could be taken. And because of my faith in God, he was saying, my soul will live on. Right after that show on November 19th, he got on his motorcycle to go home on the 210 freeway. He was in the diamond lane. A car swerved over, hit him, and there was his body laying there on the 210 freeway. And he succumbed to his injuries. And people say, oh my gosh, how did he predict that? He prophesied his own death. No, he had no idea. He had no idea when he said, he said at any moment, little did he know that it was going to be the next moment. He had no idea. But what he was saying is a truth that James would say as well. What is our life? Our life is like a mist. It is a mist that, that appears and then disappears like that. Here in the South Bay, we, we have fog. I've seen the fog last for a couple days. And yet I've seen days where the fog comes and it's gone by 10 a.m. That, that mist appears and disappears, and we never know when. It, it's like that. And what James's point is, you don't know what your life is going to look like. So how can we boast that, that it's going to look like this in 10 years from now if we don't even know if we're going to make it 10 minutes from now? Yet God, who knows the number of our days, according to the Psalms, knows the content of our days. He not only knows how many days you have in this lifetime, but he knows what each day looks like according to his will. And so, so James, are, are you saying it's wrong for us to make plans? 
Is, is that really what he's saying? Well, here's the answer. I don't think he's saying that at all. No, it's not wrong to make plans. So as long as God is in the picture, it's not wrong to make plans as long as you're a godly planner. Godly planner. What does that mean? What's a godly planner? Well, let me try to explain that to you. Like I said earlier, all of us are planners. We all plan subconsciously or consciously. We, we all make plans in one form or another. But there are three kind of planners. I like to break it down like this. First of all, some of us are godless planners. Would you guys write that down in your notes? Some of us are godless planners. You leave God out of the picture. God's nowhere to be found when it comes to your plan. So James isn't saying it's wrong to plan. He's just rebuking those who leave God out of the plans. And he calls this, this he calls it, out these people who are arrogant in their self-sufficiency, who boast and say, I-, I know what I want and I won't be satisfied until I get it. And so, so this is what I'm going to do to get it. And some of us, that, that, might be, that might be you. You're godless in your planning. And, and we get really, I know you're here in church right now, yet we get really good at compartmentalizing our lives. Like God, God is... He, he goes in this compartment on Sunday mornings from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. And between that period, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus, here's my heart. I cry out to you. And, then, and some of you go over and beyond, not just Sunday, but, but he gets my, my uh, compartment on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Because that's when I do life group. And I go to my life group, and, I, and I'll talk about God and talk about the Word. And, and those are the compartments that you have. And yet, the compartment from Monday to Friday, from 8 to 5 p.m., where's God? Nowhere to be found. Where's God? You wouldn't know because your, your head is down, and you're grinding forward because you're going to get that money, and you're going to build that family, and you're going to get that home so that you can get that retirement package, so you can get that leisure out of this world. And it's like some of us can go about our business and our lives and our plans without ever once thinking about God's role in any of this. It's got nothing to do with your studies, got nothing to do with your your business, where you live, and how you're going to get there. My plans are my plans. God is God, and he's meant for worshiping on the weekends, but during the week, my plans are my plans. And you may not say that with your mouth, but that you say that with your lives. And in verse 16, James would be so blunt to say, all such boasting is evil. It's evil. There's nothing great about that. It's straight evil. Why? Evil, what's the definition of evil? Evil is the absence of good. And when you leave God out of the plans, you're leaving good out of the plans. There's no God and there's no good when, they're, when you make these kind of plans, and it's, it's just evil. And so to boast in your own self-sufficiency and imply that you don't need God to get where you want to get, that's godless. And godless planning is evil. So there's godless planners, and God forbid any godless planner is here in this church. But there's a second kind of planner. I call them god light planners. Would you write that down? god light planners. What, what's a god light planner? You know, when you have a reduced version of the real thing, you have a reduced version of the real thing, because some of us do include God in our plans. Like, like you, you'll pray and you'll get desperate for God. God, please give me success. God, please help me make this deadline. God, please help me, help, help, help me get into this school. And we get desperate. Jesus, take the wheel. And like, you'll give it all to God. Right? God, I need you. And then when you get it, it's like, praise God, that was all you, God. That was good looking out, that was all you. But when things don't go as planned, at least not as we planned, when that business deal falls through, when that buyer pulls out, we don't get into that program or that school, it's, okay, God, where are you at? And you start questioning God, like, is God, are you even real? Like, do you even love me? Do you even care about me? And you start, your faith goes into crisis mode. All of a sudden, you put God in back. Jesus, give me that wheel back. Let me, let me take this into my hands. And now, now it's like God's not even in a picture anymore because it's not going according to your plan. And now you got to take matters into your own hands to get what you want to get. And you're not going to stop until you do. That's what I call God light planning. 
Like you totally trust God is in control up until the moment things don't go, don't go according to your plan. Now God's in the back seat. You're not particularly, particularly interested in his plan or the way he does certain things in your life. You insist on making your plan work. There's Godless planners, there are Godlike planners, but then there are Godly planners. Would you write that down? There are Godly planners. And these are the people who make their plans, which let me, let me say it very clearly, it's not wrong to make plans. But these are people who make plans and yet are wholeheartedly dependent on the will of God. Like, you're, you're the ones who make your plans, and yet sincerely, with all your heart, you pray, as James says in verse 15, if, if the Lord wills, then I will do this or do that. And there's this humility, not, not this arrogance, not this self-sufficiency, but this humble dependence on God that, that he truly will do as he pleases in my life according to his will. And your dependence is on him instead of yourself. And that dependence is so secure and that trust is so certain that even when you don't get that job position that you were sure was yours or you don't get married at 25 like you, you were certain you would or when you don't have children when you knew you, knew you were going to have at least two, you're able to say, God, I, I trust that your will is better than mine. And you wholly trust that God who knows the number of your days also knows the content of your days. And his will will be done. And so I will surrender myself to his will and trust my life into his hands because they're good hands. They are good hands. I didn't originally have this in my message, but I talked with Monica to see if it will be okay to share this. You know, when we uh, had our first two kids, uh, I'm just going to be real. Like, it w it's hard for us. And, like, I, I know some families have five kids, six kids, and they just want more, and they could do it. But honestly, for us, given the nature of our lifestyles and the demands of ministry, two was a strain. Like, like we were barely surviving with two, and, and, and it would be the source of arguments and, and, and tension and stress, and we decided that's it. We tap out. We're, we're done. We're done. We can't have any more, right, for the sake of our marriage and the health of our home. And so when we found out that Monica was pregnant with a third, we weren't ready for that. Like, when we found out she was pregnant again, there were tears, they weren't tears of joy. They were tears of fear. And I was like, God, how, how are we going to do this? God, you know we were maxed out. Like, how are we going to do this? And all these emotions of, of what's going to happen now. And yet when, when we thought about it, we stopped and thought about this. God knew where we were at. God knew what we could handle and what we couldn't handle. He knew we were trying not to have another kid. And yet, by his sovereignty and his will, he decided to create this life inside of her womb. There's this sense of peace that God is up to something, and for some reason, God wants to bring this human being into this world for his glory and his purposes. And, and now we start thinking, well, what does God want to do with this child? Maybe he has plans for his glory. Maybe he's going to use this child to save thousands of souls. Or, or maybe it's just to say one other soul, that would be worth it. Or maybe it's just that this soul would come to know Jesus and belong to Jesus. Whatever it was, there's this peace of knowing that, that God has a plan and a purpose and it prevails against ours. It's not according to our plans, but he knows what he's doing. And when we began to trust him, we were able to surrender to him and not only be filled with peace, but now a joy. And Aranea has been such a blessing to have in this world. I can't wait to see how he's going to use her life. Proverbs 19.21 says this, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. So you could be a godless planner and leave them out. That's evil. You could be a godlike planner Make plans and trust in him up until it doesn't go according to your plans. And then leave him out. That's evil. 
or you could be godly in your plans and trust in God's will and ultimate plans over yours. So, so that's, that's the first issue we, we see in these passages. Uh, is it wrong to make plans for your future? No, it's not. You just keep God in the picture. Surrender to his will. Here's the second question we're going to ask. Is it wrong for Christians to be rich? Is it wrong for Christians to be rich? Because James has some strong words of judgment against the rich here in this passage. Check out what he says. Verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1. He says, come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Stop right there. Would you circle those words, weep and howl? I don't know if you know, those are words of misery, right? To to weep, that could be outward or that can be an inward expression of remorse or misery. It could be either or. But when you get to the word how, like there's nothing great about that. that. That's a straight up outward expression of suffering and misery. How do we know that? Well, let me show you the Greek word for it. It's a really cool word uh, in the Greek language, which James wrote in. It's an onomatopoeia. You guys know what onomatopoeia is? Right? When, when the word resembles the sound it makes, right? Like a bomb goes boom. A duck goes quack, right? A, a bee goes buzz. A Batman goes what? Pow. And Robin goes blap. And Batman goes sock. And Robin goes biff. That's an onomatopoeia. It sounds like the sound it makes. The word is the sound it makes. Well, in the Greek, they, they have onomatopoeias. And, and that word for how is the sound you make when you, you wail. It's, it's a weird word. I don't know how it, it, it's the Greek word ololazo. Everyone say ololazo, ololazo. I, I guess that's how Greek people wail, ololazo, right? Like, like it's, it's just the sound of misery. And that's what he's saying, ololazo. Why? Why is it going to be so miserable? Why, why would they have to wail? Well, look what he says in verse 2. Because your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Let's stop right there. Man, seriously, James, is it really that evil to be rich? that you should write such harsh words about judgment? Because, I mean, I think about the Bible. What about men after God's own heart, like King David, who was a wealthy king? What about Solomon, right, who who God richly blessed at a time when he was a righteous man? I think about the really wealthy Joseph of Arimathea, who, who purchased a tomb to lay the body of his king. Like, what about those guys? And so, so is it wrong to be rich? Well, here's the evidence from Scripture. If we look out throughout Scripture, the, the conclusion is no, it's not wrong. You can relax. It's not wrong to be wealthy. But listen, the wealthy can be wrong. I'll say that again. It's not wrong to be wealthy, but the wealthy can be wrong. How so? Because if you are unrighteous with your wealth, there's a difference between righteous wealth and unrighteous wealth. How can we tell if I'm being unrighteous? Well, a good measure for, for how righteous or unrighteous we are, we, we can gather from this passage. And I think we can ask ourselves two soul-searching questions and ask the Holy Spirit to search our souls, to search our hearts. Here's the first soul-searching question. Would you guys write this down? And ask yourself, how am I acquiring my wealth? How am I acquiring my wealth? Because there's an unrighteous way to acquire it. For example, in verse 4, he says to these unrighteous wealthy people, he says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have, li- you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person he doesn't, he doesn't resist you. Pause right there. And so what James is basically saying is the unrighteous rich are those who acquire their wealth at other people's expense by oppressing the poor. And he says that's evil. There's nothing great about that. 
some of these Jews, for example, were, were hiring people and they were withholding and cheating them out of their wages, not giving them what they deserve. And that's evil. That's fraud, he says. It's deception. And then in verse 6, it says, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. How, how do they condemn and murder them? Well, he's talking about judicial oppression. According to some of the background commentaries that, that I read, it, it would say that this is actually a thing where the rich would take poor people to court knowing that they're defensive, defenseless. They're not able to defend themselves. They don't have a voice. And so inevitably they would win. And when you do that, I mean, the, the Old Testament had to literally condemn this practice repeatedly because it was a thing. Later Jewish texts actually equated judicial oppression with, with murder, calling it a form of murder. Why? Because when you're taking these voiceless and defenseless people and putting them, them in court, you're stripping from them their livelihood. You're taking away from them their food and their clothing and their shelter. You're essentially wiping them out of what they have and you're killing them. So what's he saying? Basically, the unrighteous rich are those who have this unhealthy lust and desire for wealth so strong that they'll do whatever it takes to acquire it even if it means getting it at the expense of the less fortunate. They'll get it at all costs, even if it means getting it in unrighteous ways and oppressing the poor. There's nothing great about that. God hates it. And that's why he says in verse 4, the cries of these harvesters, these victims, have reached the ears of who? The, the Lord of hosts. Not just the Lord the Lord of hosts, and, and that's a Hebrew title that James uses, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, Lord of heavenly armies, angel armies. And it draws a picture in the Jewish mind of a God who is a commanding general, the leader of an army who will come to fight. He will wage war against injustice. He's going to fight for his poor. And this general does not lose. He cannot lose. Watch out. And so what's the application for us here in this church? I pray that you would ask yourselves this question. Do I, if I profess faith in Christ Jesus and I'm serious about my faith, am I acquiring my wealth unrighteously? I recognize that God has blessed this congregation. There's some of us who are business owners or employers, or maybe you're a manager or a supervisor, and, and you receive your income off of what people do for you. Like people make money for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's part of our society, uh, the, way they, the way we work. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's you and you're a person of faith, I urge you to ask yourself, am I compens compensating them in a way that is fair and that is deserved, maybe even gracious? The work that they do provides you your wealth. Do you compensate them to provide for their living? And maybe you do that just fine, but, but really consider that. Do you think of their comfort? Or do you only think about how they can enhance your own? And your own luxury and your own wealth? And are you doing it in a righteous way? Or is there any unrighteousness in what you're doing? So that's, that's an application, but, but here, here's the reality. Let's broaden this application a bit because this principle of acquiring wealth unrighteously doesn't only apply to wealthy business owners and employers and managers. This applies to all of us because you may or may not be considered wealthy in your own mind, but all of us in this room can try to acquire wealth. And how are you doing it? Are you committing any form of fraud or deception to cheat other people? Are you attaining wealth at other people's expense? Let me give you an example. This past Black Friday, you know, Monica and I, since we got married in 2009, we've never bought a TV for ourselves since then. And so it's been almost 10 years, like, right? So like we, we figured, okay, let's, let's buy a TV this Black Friday. Let's see if there's any deals. And so we had this mantle above our fireplace and we measured the dimensions and we, we know what we wanted. And to be honest, Monica and I, we don't, we don't watch a lot of TV. We really don't. Um, 
But we figured out the dimensions, and so we decided to, to look for a Samsung TV, because that's the only kind of TV we know. And so we looked at the Samsung line in those dimensions and literally found the bottom of the line TV, the bottom of the line model, the cheapest one you can find. Plus, it, there's a Black Friday deal, so it was like a pretty hefty discount, and we had a gift card for that. So we purchased this TV, and we waited, and we received it the week after Thanksgiving. We, we had a guy come out, professionally mount it, and I, I don't know a lot about TVs, but when I'm watching this TV, man, this is a nice TV. Like, this is a really nice TV. It's really clear and really crisp, and it's, it's a smart TV, and I'm learning what that means, and, and, and there's all these features and functions, and man, it feels like this guy's in my room. It's like, it's so clear. This doesn't feel like a bottom-of-the-line TV. This feels like a top-of-the-line TV. That's because I found out it is. The shipping company called me and said, hey, sorry, we delivered to you another customer's TV. And I looked up the model, and it is a lot more expensive than the one I paid for. It is a lot more expensive than the one I paid for. And this is like a third-party shipping company, and so, you know, it's a small operation, and you can hear the fear and the nervousness in this man. And we hung up the phone, and we heard nothing else. I said, well, send somebody out to, to switch it out. We didn't hear anything. And... uh as I was going through this week, I, I, I resolved, I'll just wait till they call me. I'll let them do the work, reach out. To, it's their mistake, their fault. Let them reach out to me. We didn't hear anything. And as I, I was preparing this message about acquiring wealth unrighteously, um, <laughs> the Lord grabbed a hold of my heart. And so I said, I, I got to call the company. I got to call the, the company that this TV came from and I'm, I'm not trying to be holy up here, okay? I'm not trying to be holy. I, I'll be honest with you guys. It was so hard for me to pick up that phone and talk to that customer service representative and say, hi, I'm just calling to tell you that you gave me a much better TV than, uh, than, I, than I paid for. <laughs> you know, right? Like, and and I, I just had to, I had to tell them, I, I have a TV that doesn't belong to me, and I want to make sure you guys know about it, and nobody's taking a hit for this. And... I could reason, and I, I justified at one point, well, this is not a big loss to the company. They'll just give them another TV. And I'm thinking, it, it's not going to affect them. But then how do I know that? Who am I to say that? What if it does? What if it doesn't affect this company? What if it, it, it's, get, it's taken out from the shipping company? And maybe it's a small operation. Maybe their livelihood depends on this. How, how do I know? And so in my heart, I, I know I needed to make it right. So I, I told him, please, can, can you make sure that this is okay with everybody and no, nobody's taking a loss on this? And I literally sat on the phone for 45 minutes trying to figure this out. And after 45 minutes, they, they said, we don't have any notes on this. There's no conclusion. And we hung up the phone. They said, we'll call you back. Hung up the phone. And I still haven't heard back from them. Praise God, right? Like, oh, thank you. <laughs> I've been keeping my phone off for the past few days, so if I don't reach you, I'm sorry. That's, that's why. Uh, no, but you know what? Like, I realize the word tells me God hates greed. God hates greed. And those who acquire wealth unrighteously will weep and will howl. And in a season where material possession is on our mind more than any time of, other time of the year, may greed never cause any of us, people of God, to acquire wealth at someone else's expense. Because that's fruitless faith. And the faithless will be judged. Okay, so, so that's the first question. How am I acquiring my wealth? Here's the second. How am I applying my wealth? How am I applying my wealth? Is it righteously or unrighteously? You know, I read a recent news article. This is crazy to me. Uh, of a famous rapper who, I, in my opinion, applies his wealth unrighteously. I mean, he's a famous rapper. You would know his name if I mentioned it because he has made a lot of money, at least 50 cent, right? And, and so, so this guy's up at the club. <laughs> what? This guy's at the club, and, and it says in this article that he's making it rain in the club. You know what it means to make it rain? 
some of you guys don't know, so let me show you. It's, it's when you take all the money you have, uh, let's see, oh, hey, $4, right? So um, you take your money, and this guy had stacks and stacks and stacks of money. And he's in the club, and he just makes it. It's when you sprinkle it all over the crowd to boast and show how much you have. You know, sorry, can I get the back? <laughs> <laughs> It's my dinner money. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what he did, right? He, he made it rain in the club, and then the article says he goes back onto the stage, and he grabs all his money back, and he runs out of the club. I mean, unright. first of all, don't boast about how much money you have. Secondly, don't take back what you're saying you're giving the people. Right? That, that's, that's selfish, and on so many levels, there's this unrighteousness. And here's what James says about those of you who are unrighteous in your wealth. Verse 3, he says, you have laid up treasures for yourself. You've laid up treasures for yourself. Verse 5, it says, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. And so is it wrong to be wealthy? Is it wrong to be rich? The question is, how are you applying it? Because if you're hoarding your treasures to yourself, and you're using it to indulge in yourself, and you have no intention, no thoughts uh, of looking to distribute, distribute it where there is real need, then take seriously this warning. You are storing up for yourselves judgment and wrath. James describes in verse 5, he says, you're fattening your hearts for the day of slaughter. That language that he uses is the language that the prophet Jeremiah used to talk about fattening calves for the sacrifice, right? And so, so the idea is, yeah, you can fatten up your hearts and fill yourselves with delight and pleasures from this world, and, and you can enjoy your luxuries and self-indulge, but you're just fattening up your hearts for the day of slaughter. That's, that's a reference to the day of judgment. That, those are some serious words. That's extreme language. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, I mean, Really? I thought as a Christian, I'm saved by grace through faith. Doesn't that spare me from judgment and wrath? I would say to that, amen. And the scriptures would say, amen. If you are saved by faith, you're saved by grace, and you are spared any kind of judgment and wrath. But here's the key, and this is the point of the entire series we've been doing. If you're truly a believer who lives by faith, then your faith will be demonstrated by your actions. If you're a truly a believer who, who is full of faith and lives by faith, your faith will be proven by your actions. And so the way you apply your faith will be seen in the way you apply your wealth. I'll say that again. The way you apply your faith will be seen in the way you apply your wealth. So here's the application. We have to ask ourselves, if I am a believer in Jesus Christ and I am full of faith, do I apply my wealth righteously or is it unrighteous? Some of us in this place have been blessed to make some good money. We receive good income. And I know it's very common to think, tempting to think, I have this much because I earned it. I put in the hard work. You don't know how many hours I've spent. I I've worked hard. I've earned it. And, and I believe you. I'm not even going to question that. I believe that. But I'm willing to bet that you're not the only ones who work hard. You're not. Maybe what you have is a result of your hard work, but there are people who work just as hard as you, I'm sure. Perhaps maybe even harder than you who will only make a fraction in their lifetime of what you've made for reasons beyond themselves, for various reasons. They will work so hard and maybe never break the minimum wage. I don't know why that happens. But if you are one who has acquired wealth because you work hard for it, I would say to you, give glory where glory is due. God has been the one who has richly blessed you. Because not everyone who works as hard as you will make what you do. And so why is that? Why is it that person A can work really hard and receive a ton of wealth, and person B can work just as hard, maybe even harder, and never break the minimum wage? How is that fair? Why does God care about this person and not care about this person? Who said God doesn't care about this person? 
God never said that. Because I don't know about you, but I know this. The one who has been given much, much is to be expected. Luke 12, 48 talks about this. The one who's been given much, I expect a lot from you. What does he expect? Well, one is that he has greater responsibility and greater expectation if he's been materially blessed to care for those who are less fortunate. Scripture is very clear about this. Let me show you one case. For example, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 says this. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Go ahead, enjoy it. That's okay. It came from God. He wants you to enjoy it. But listen, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, not this age, the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. And so the expectation from Scripture is that you who are full of faith and who are rich would be faithful with your riches to help those who are less fortunate. 2 Corinthians 9, we won't go there today, but go, go there in your time and look. God blesses you so that you would be rich in good works. Sometimes we think, if I, if I do good works, maybe God will bless me. Well, he says the opposite is true. Sometimes he will bless you so that you will be rich in good works. I'm giving you this so that you would do something with it. I'm giving you this so that you would do something with it. And if, if you live your life like that, then that way you know you're not hoarding for yourselves and laying up treasures simply for yourself here on earth, which James says is a mist anyways, not taking that with you. But you know that you're laying up treasures for yourselves in the eternal age to come. You're working for a reward that is eternal and will not disappear like mist. I want to close with sharing you, with you something that um, I know I risk some judgment sharing this, and I talked it over with Monica, but, but we agree that if, if this challenges you to put your faith in God and put your faith into action, then it's worth the risk. Um, since Monica and I got married over the years, uh, we, we've been, you know, confronted by different people in ministry missionaries, ministers of the gospel who live off of financial support. And they've come to us asking, would you be a partner and help me so that I can do what God has called me to do? And every time one of these comes our, our way, the same question comes up. But if I support you now and I give to you on a regular basis, like, what if one day I can't do that anymore? What if one day I fall on hard times and something happens to us and, and we can't support you anymore? And that question, that fear and that uncertainty always comes up. And yet every time we've stopped and we've looked at our budget and we've, we've seen I can support you now and we've concluded I can't tell you what's going to happen down the road. I don't know what tomorrow holds. Only God knows that. We just study that. Only God knows what tomorrow holds. And so we've made decisions. You know what? I can do it now, so I'm going to do it now, and I will commit to you now. If that day comes when I can't do it anymore, then we'll have to make a decision, decision then. But today, I'm going to step forward in faith, and we're going to commit to you. And, and it's, it's been years, and to this day, there's still four Missionaries and ministers that we support on top of our tithe and offering. On t this is not in place of our offering. This is not like, okay, God, this is my source. No, the, this is on top and saying, God, I trust that what you have given to us is to be used for your purposes, to get the gospel to people. To this day, we can still support them, and God's been providing enough for us to do so. I want to challenge you, church. Our life is so short. It is a mist. It's not wrong to have wealth in this lifetime. But how are you applying your wealth? Now, I want to recap this whole message right now as we close. First of all, church, it's not wrong to plan for your future. It's not. So long as God is in that picture. 
And I'm telling you, if you include God in that picture, the future you're planning for goes way beyond the future in this lifetime. You're planning for the future, the age to come. And I want to recap, church, it's not wrong to be rich. If God richly blesses you and you're acquiring it righteously and you're applying it righteously according to his will, it's not wrong. Because if God is in the picture, then the riches that he gives you will be enjoyed by you. Enjoy it. But it will also be shared with others for the purposes of God's glory. You will see that you've been blessed to be a blessing. And so I pray, church, that we will be a people, people of God, of genuine faith, who hold so loosely to, to our plans and our possessions here in this life so that according to God's will, we will take hold and have a tight grip on the king and the kingdom in the life to come. Amen? Amen. Would you guys bow and pray with me? And so, God, that is our our desire, Lord. And if it's not, I pray that right now you would make it our desire to be, to be people of genuine faith who are gonna trust you by faith as a God who holds our lives in your hands. And so God, we will surrender our plans to you as we, as we make the plans, as we go about, we will keep our eyes fixed on you and ask that your will will be done. God, we thank you so much that even when it doesn't go that way and you direct our paths, we thank you that you're the God who makes our path straight. And God, thank you so much for the ways you have blessed us. Lord, some of us have more wealth than others, but Lord, all of us have received amazing grace. So God, with the much that we have or the little that we have, we pray that we would use it righteously, that we would think about how you would want us to spend it for your glory, your kingdom, your namesake, that we would think with our eyes open and look for people who just need expressions of the goodness and grace of God. Thank you for this church. It's filled with the most gracious people on earth, Lord. Thank you so much. Help us to continue to do so more and more. And we worship you, acknowledging that you are the source of everything we have. So that's why we praise you and worship you. Thank you in Jesus' name.